That is no Orkhorn. Where was Gondor when the Westfold fell? Where are Theoden's men? Where were the elves when Mordor's forces summoned Grand to smash down the Great Gate of Minas Tirith? We look at this today. Remember everyone, if you find this video helpful, informative or entertaining today, please remember to hit that subscribe button below. By subscribing, you'll never miss out on any of our latest videos and you'll be supporting us to continue creating great content like this. Okay, so imagine now, you've only seen the movie versions of Tolkien's epic tale. After all, I have no doubt there are many of you here today right now for which that is the case. In the movies, the elves come to Helm's Deep in the Two Towers, right? So you might end up scratching your head and thinking, well, why didn't they show up at Minas Tirith too? But here's the thing, sometimes movies change the story a bit. It's like when you retell a story yourself and maybe add your own little twist to it. That's exactly what happened here with Peter Jackson and his team. The elves never arrived at Helm's Deep, and of course never in Gondor too. So for our answer today, we will of course be looking at the books and focusing ourselves there. We do not have the strength to fight both Mordor and Isengard. Before the diversion to draw Sauron's attention to Aragorn and away from the notion that other plans may be in motion, the truth is rather more complex. The elves at the beginning of the story of the Lord of the Rings are somewhat of a waning people. Many are ready to leave Middle-earth altogether and go into the west. However, what is left out of the book are the numerous and epic battles fought by those elves that do remain against the forces of Sauron. They might not be as great as they once were, but they are not finished yet. So to understand what they were doing and how much or little they may have helped, we need to look at a couple of different battles, the three battles of Lorien, the war for Murkrit, and figure out just what was going on. So let's not forget, during the War of the Ring, battles were happening everywhere. For example, while Frodo and Sam were taking the pass of Kirith Ungol, elsewhere a huge battle was unfolding in Dale. Yes, the same Dale that we know of from the Hobbit tale. There, the great dwarf king Dane sadly met his end. A lot of these things we don't hear in the main story, but the great appendices at the end of the book really fill us in. The fires of war touched many lands, and unlike the film's ending, the peaceful Shire was not spared either. It became a dirty, smog-filled place controlled by rough characters and the once powerful, disgraced wizard of Saruman who now went by the name of Sharky. The movie didn't show how the hobbits later stood up and reclaimed their home, raising an army in the Battle of Bywater. I mean, we have discussed why the filmmakers skipped this part in another video, so if you're curious, please go and check that out on the channel, but it just emphasises that the horrors of war were not avoided, no matter your race, even if you were a hobbit, let alone an elf. When Frodo escapes the clutches of a maddened Boromir during the break of the Fellowship, he goes on to see the following while upon the seat of seeing at Amon Hen while he is wearing the One Ring. But everywhere he looked he saw the signs of war. The misty mountains were crawling like anthills, orcs were issuing out of a thousand holes. Under the boughs of Mirkwood there was a deadly strife of elves and men and foul beasts. The land of the Bjornings was aflame, a cloud was over Moria smoke rose on the borders of Lorien. This hints at the first of the three conflicts involving the Galadrim of Lorien and the orcs that came to attack them. There were three distinct battles fought in the March of 3019 of the Third Age on the 11th, 15th and 22nd. What we are slowly introduced to is a world at war which, intentionally or not, reflected the consciousness of the period in which the work was written. While Professor Tolkien was not intending allegory, and was quite famous in his opposition to it. He did distinguish between allegory, which is a sort of trick on the reader, and applicability, which has more to do with the universal themes which unfold throughout the story, as all the great myths and legends have. They are both timely and timeless. The elves were successful in their defence and came out victorious. Although Galadriel is seen as one of the most powerful, it was Celeborn, her husband, who would afterwards lead their people across the Anduin to rid Dol Guldur of the influence of Sauron forever after. It is also interesting to note as a side point here, after this was all done the War of the Ring was over, Thranduil, the Alvan King of Mirkwood, gave the southern area of Mirkwood to Celeborn, where it would then become known as East Lorien. But anyway, 
Professor Tolkien explained that the success of the Lorien Owls wasn't just about their fighting skills, as impressive as they were. Instead, it was largely due to the mystical force radiating from their land, reminiscent of the protective girdle of Melian from the First Age. This magic once shielded the Kingdom of Doriath, considered to be the greatest of the realms of the Sindar, where the Maya Melian ruled alongside the elf King Thingol, until it fell to the power of Morgoth. Back to the Third Age. Roughly at the time of the First Battle of Lorien was the invasion of Rohan. By this time, Isengard had been defeated and the orcs there wished to stop any forces which may or may not provide any form of aid to Gondor. They wanted to divide the realms of men. When reading the story, it is sometimes hard to realise how much the events of the War of the Ring in fact overlap one another, but that is a skill of Sauron in a way. The power of Sauron was not just that of his own fell sorcery, but the way in which he is able to bound up the world in that same misery too. In fact, we do have a great video on how Sauron makes war, so if you're kind of more interested in diving into that, please go and check out that video as well. The board is set. The pieces are moving. So, just as the Battle of Dale begins, we know that the Witch King is able to break the gates of Minas Tirith and enter the city. At that same time, Aragorn has unfurled his standard and has rode into the battle that comes to define the war for men on the Western Front, the largest single conflict of the war that is depicted. Of course, this is the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. While we must remember that, though the films are of course masterpieces, so much stuff is trimmed, recontextualised, or scrapped altogether. As mentioned earlier, the Elves do not join the Battle of the Hornburg, yet the arrival of the Elves at Helm's Deep is a poignant moment in the film and calls to mind the spirit of the Last Alliance. The War of the Ring was never a single engagement or even a single series of engagements. It was not a war between the Fellowship and all of their friends. It was a war of Middle Earth, and when the fires of war did burn, many a beautiful thing turned to ash, and there were flames about the woods of Lothlorien and the battles did hasten the speedy departure of the elves who already waned in the world. It is not that they did not want to help, or they didn't help at all, they did, but their numbers were just not great enough in this day and age to fight on multiple fronts, even with someone as mighty as Galadriel in their ranks. But with having a look at those in Lothlorien, what about elsewhere too? We briefly mentioned King Thranduil and his action from when the war was over, but what about during? Well, the Elves of Mirkwood were attacked just like those of Lothlorien, with the majority of those attackers coming from Dol Guldur. We do not get much information on this apart from knowing that Thranduil and his forces managed to repel these attackers. His eye is fixed on Rivendell. So now what about those in Rivendell? Did Alron just sit back with his feet up while his kin all fought for their lives? Well, Alrond himself took on a very important advisor type role, more than wielding a sword during the war. He helped form the Fellowship, and even sent his own sons to assist Aragorn in his quest. At the end of the day, Alrond needed to protect his home in case an attack came, and they did not have the numbers to do much more than this. We must also remember, Alrond had the Ring of Power, Vilya, but this probably wouldn't have helped in terms of battle, if you were maybe thinking that. It didn't improve Alrond's fighting prowess, but instead helped preserve his realm. After all, we must remember too, the Elven Rings of Power were created and forged with the idea of extending their time in Middle-earth with the thought of peace, not one to win wars. And then finally, if you were perhaps too wondering about Círdan and the Grey Havens, their story is similar again. They are there to maintain and look after what they have, as their numbers cannot stretch further than their own realm here. And in fact, after talking about elves for pretty much this whole video, I feel a nice way to finish here is to look at a quote that comes from none other than the man Faramir. May seem a bit strange, but I feel like it works well with the way many of the race of elves likely thought. War must be, while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. So there we have it. The question of the elves' involvement in the War of the Ring invites us to delve deeper into Tolkien's intricate tapestry of Middle-earth, where every thread tells its own story, and often in the shadows of the larger narrative. From the battle in Lothlorien to the defence of Mirkwood, the elves were anything but idle bystanders. 
Their valiant efforts across various fronts, though not always highlighted as prominently as the Siege of Minas Tirith, were crucial in keeping Sauron's forces at bay. The portrayal of elves in the movies offers only a slice of their broader significance in the literary world Tolkien crafted. Their role during the war was not of grand armies sweeping across fields, but of brave hearts defending their homelands, and in some cases, preparing for the impending departure from Middle Earth. As the Age of Men dawned, the elves, with all their majesty and melancholy, showcased their resilience and commitment to the world they had loved and lived in for so long. They might not have been present at every battleground, but their essence, their legacy, and their sacrifices are woven into the very fabric of Middle-earth's history. With that now though, it is time for my question of the day, which is… Of all the Alvin battles mentioned today, which would you like to know more about? The attacks on Lorien? The ones of Mirkwit? Or maybe you just want to see more of somewhere else? Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section down below. And now to shout out our patrons. You guys have been amazing in supporting our short film project. We have got some amazing updates coming soon. We are really making good progress and I cannot thank you all enough. We have the Divine Power tier member of Kevin, the Fire Demon tier member of Nasheath, and the wizard staff tier members of John, Andrew, and Hunter. You are all true legends of the Bro Hiram. Finally, I really appreciate your time in watching this video today. If you've enjoyed the content, please consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell icon with notifications enabled, so that you will get notified when all future videos are released. Thank you once again for your support, and I look forward to seeing you next time on The Broken Sword.